Well, it's 7 o'clock and time for us to begin. Glad you're here. Beautiful day today and nice weather. Maybe tomorrow will be nice as well and all the storms will, will go around us. It just won't happen at all. Hope so. Glad you're here. Let's begin the word of prayer. John Wendell, would you lead some prayer? We've been doing, we started last week or a couple of weeks ago talking about just some major events in the book of Genesis and, and then we're going to go to Exodus and talk about some of those and we're not going verse by verse, just look at some of the major events and talk about those. Uh, last week we talked about the flood and the Tower of Babel and, and in Genesis 1 through 11 that's where you find these four major events that happen and then from chapters 12 through chapter 50, the end of the book, you find mainly works or people like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Uh, they're the ones that are discussed there on out. So tonight we're going to talk about Abraham and, and a little bit about Isaac, uh, talk about them two individuals and, and what part they played in God's role of bringing about uh, salvation to man. But first of all, we find Abraham. And we know that he's called the father of the faithful. And we know that uh, he was given a promise that through his seed, through his descendants, uh, all the nations will be blessed. His descendants would be more than the stars in the sky and the heavens, more than the sand on the sea, and that would be his descendants. And in a sense, we are his descendants as well. Maybe not by blood, but by faith we are because he's the father of our faith and, and that's where, this, where we're going with this. But through his descendants, his blood, Jesus would eventually come. And because of that, we have salvation and what the Gospels tell us about Christ and, and him even with us even today. But in Genesis 12 verse 1, we find where that promise is given. Now the Lord has said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and I will, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So here's a promise that God gives to Abraham. He's 75 years old, and and Abraham is probably thinking, how is God going to do this? Here I am, 75 years old, and I don't have any children. Uh, wife, she's barren, can't bear any children. So I don't know how God's going to take care of this, but, but still God knew how he was going to do it. And he knew the end at the beginning. So here's God, he's got a plan. He tells Abraham the beginning of this plan and your descendants. And Abraham may be thinking, again, I don't have any children. How can I have descendants? You know, Abraham Lincoln had no, has, had no descendants. There's none, uh, none, no children or grandchildren or anything after him. After him, it was it. Well, I, Abraham may be thinking the same thing. I don't know how this can be. I don't know how it's going to work out, but, but yet he's going he's to have a hand in it, of course, in making this plan come true. And according to Genesis, uh, Galatians 4, verse 4, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman under the law. So start with Abraham, here's your promise. And then when the time was right, that's when Christ arrived. That's when he arrived, born of a woman there, born under the law. And uh, again, the rest is, is history, as we know. How he came about and born and started his work, his ministry. One thing that Abraham did that was a mistake 
was his attempt to help God. You know, God's going to need some help in this. You know, here I am of this age, and, and I'll, I'll try to take matters into my own hands here, and, and I'll try to work it out. But again, that, that's the, the era of Abraham, and our era as well, if we try to do that. We're just going to need to wait and let God, in some cases, work things out. But here's what he says in Genesis 15, 1. Now after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Elzer of Damascus. Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born of my house is my, is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one will come from your own body shall be your heir. So first thing Abram's thinking here, what about I have one heir here, here in the house, one child, is it going to come through him? I guess that's going to be it. That's what Abraham's thinking. And God tells him, no, your thinking's wrong again. It's not going to come through the one that's in your household. It's going to come from you. It's going to come from your body, not from somebody else's. So Abraham is told this in Genesis 15, and he's around 75 years of age. And about 11 years have, are, are fixed in the past, and he's getting a little anxious. When is God going to keep this promise? Well, in six, chapter 16 and verse 1, it's where the the problems begin. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid servant whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid, perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarah. Now Sarah is going to take matters to her hand. God doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm too old. Abraham, well, he thought he was too old, but here he takes the advice of his wife to go for the handmaid here. And there he listens to her. And obviously she is thinking, you know, God needs help in fulfilling this promise. So, as we know, the story... Uh, Hagar has, has a child, Ishmael. And there's where the problems begin. And the problems that happen right here, we're still having to deal with today. Because what nation came out of Ishmael's lineage? What group of people? All the Arabs. You look overseas, you got uh, Iraq, Iran. Syria, I guess Egypt, all that Middle East came out of Hagar giving birth to Ishmael. And if, if they hadn't done this, if they had just waited on God, think of maybe how peaceful the world might be, especially right now, with all the tension that's going on over there and how they hate America, how they hate Christianity and and on it goes. If Sarah and Abraham had just waited, wouldn't be having that problem. Might, may probably have some other problem, but it wouldn't be that problem. But what we can learn, at least from these verses right here, don't listen to anyone or everyone that gives you advice. Don't do it. Well, you might listen to it, but you need to take that advice and and weigh it against the Word of God. See how it, how it levels out. Uh, Abraham shouldn't have took Sarah's advice. Shouldn't. And it may be that one spouse doesn't need to take the advice of the other spouse. That may be the case. 
uh, a good friend. Maybe you don't need to take the advice of a good friend. I mean, it's a good friend. But something about that advice just doesn't fit. Be careful of that. Or some professional. Go to some professional that's got, you know, letters after their name and supposedly they know what they're talking about and they give you advice. If it goes against the Word of God, don't take it. A lady once, she was having some, just some issues and she goes to a professional. And what it boiled down to, she wasn't happy. And this professional counselor told her, whatever makes you happy, do it. Whatever. And she did. Messed her life up. Went in a direction that went against God. She knew that too. She knew that the advice that, that this individual was giving was wrong. But listen to the wrong person. A few weeks ago, a girl called the office and uh, she asked, does God want me to be happy? I said, well, give me some more, more details. And she said, here's what I want to do. And what she wanted to do was sinful. No doubt about it. Go went against the scriptures. And I told her, this is sinful. And she said, well, if God wants me to be happy, and this makes me happy, isn't it okay for me to do it? That's, that's the reasoning. If God wants me to be happy, and this makes me happy, then it should be okay for me to do it. And I said to her, uh, what about a serial killer? What makes him happy? Killing people. Is that okay then? If it makes him happy to kill people, then should he go out here and start killing folks if, just for the sake of happiness? And uh, I think she got the point on that. So if, so if God wants me to be happy, and if killing people makes me happy, I need to go out here and start killing people. And it's, it's not always about ha happiness. It's about truth and, and following God's way and, and Abraham and Sarah Got off track right here. Uh, Abraham shouldn't have listened to her. He should have said, well, no, we can't go that route. But he didn't. Then we come down to verse 11 of chapter 16. More details of the story. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child. This is Hagar. And you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. So here's the angel telling uh, Hagar, you're with child. His name's going to be Ishmael. He's going to be a tough one. He's going to be a wild man. And you look at everything that goes on over there, it's pretty much... Uh, a wild place. That's how they treat one another and, and such, but yet that's, a, that's the way they are. Uh, if you're a Muslim, you know, you believe the Bible up to about this point right here. You might say, Muslims, they don't believe in the Bible, they have the Koran. Well, they believe in Genesis chapter 1 on up to about 17 or 18. They take out, this is God. Because they look at this verse right here. They look at the promise that God made to Abraham. Through your seed, many nations will be blessed. And they will say, well, here's the promised one right here. This is the one that God was talking about. It's going to come from Abraham's body. Uh, the same thing isn't necessarily about Sarah, but that's what they're thinking right here. So, Here's where they get their Messiah at, their lineage, starting right here with Abraham when he goes to Hagar, Ishmael's born, and they start tracking the lineage, and they bring it all the way down to Muhammad. That's where they go with this. So they believe the Bible up to a point. Abraham is their father too. He's our father of faith. They say, yeah, he's our father too. But the difference comes... Is it Ishmael or is it Isaac that's the promised one that God spoke of? 
And of course, you got to let the Bible answer that to see which one is it. In chapter 17 of Genesis, beginning of verse 17, and Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God, then God said, No. Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his descendants after him. Even Abraham suggested, what about Ishmael? Why not let Ishmael be that promised one? And God said, no. The promised one, Isaac, is going to come from you and Sarah. It's not going to come through Hagar in you and through Ishmael. So Abraham, again, gives God a suggestion. And God says it's not going to be that way. So here's the first evidence that we have that Ishmael is not the promised one. It is Isaac that's the promised one that God said would come through Abraham. But yet the uh, Muslims say, no, it's Ishmael. He's the promised one. Another verse or a couple of verses that bear this out, uh, Genesis 17, 21. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. Again, he says, my covenant, my promise is going to be with Isaac. And Galatians 4.28, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. Isaac was the child of promise. Of course, if you were to show this to a, a Muslim, they're not going to believe it because they don't, they don't take anything after Genesis anyway. But we can see here where God has spoken numerous times to show that uh, Hagar and Ishmael are not the ones. The promise is coming through the promise is coming through Abraham and Sarah. So that's a, that's a pretty big event in the life of Abraham, not just that he was old when all of it happened. But, uh, but the promised one of Christ was going to come through him. Did Abraham have any more children after Isaac? What do you think? Sarah died. Isaac says, I'm just too old for this. I'm 100 years old. He remarries and has more children. He's not as old as he thought he was. But Isaac is the one. That's the one God gave the promise through. The next big event in Abraham's life was the testing of Abraham. Genesis 22 and verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, here am I. Of course, this is when uh, Abraham takes Isaac up to the mountain and there builds an altar, carries the wood in the altar and Isaac is going to be the sacrifice. That's what he's speaking of right here, what God tells Abraham to do. If God knows everything, why didn't he know what Abraham was going to do here? If God is all-knowing, why did he put Abraham through this? He knew that Abraham was going to stop and not going to kill his son why he can go through it. Well, Abraham didn't know. He didn't know what kind of faith he had. And God's fixed and put him to the test right here. And Abraham passed the test. Are we knowing this in uh, Hebrews 11? Where, Abraham, where the writer says that Abraham knew that God would raise Isaac from the dead. Because God gave Abraham the promise through this son, your son, and called God. So Abraham knew that it's going to be okay. So Abraham didn't know about his faith until he's put to the test. 
And we don't know about our faith either until we're put to the test. And we may say, I got a strong faith. And one may ask, how do you know that? How do you know it? What kind of test have God or has God put you through to show that you are strong in your faith? What kind of test? If God gave you a report card, would you have an A, a B, or C, or D, or would it be an F? What kind of test, what kind of grade would you get? But when we come through them, we're stronger for it. And then we know. And we get ready for the next test that may, may, may come about. But of course, we may crumble or we may stand strong. But hopefully we stand strong. Abraham did. God put him to the test. And, and he came through it. And then in 22, 7 and 8. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father... He said, here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. We don't know how old Isaac was right here. Uh, Jewish tradition says he was around 25. We don't know. He wasn't a little kid, but uh, he's, he was on up in age. So tradition, just tradition, says he was 25, and maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. But something you don't see right here, you don't see Isaac struggling. You know, at some point, Abraham had to say to him, Isaac, you're the sacrifice. Get on the altar. And you don't, see a, you don't see a wrestling match happening right here. And, and Abraham overcomes him and hits him in the head with a rock and picks him up and puts him on the, the altar and ties him down. Then all of a sudden Isaac wakes up and here's a knife fixing to pierce his body. You don't find that. Abraham says, here's what we're going to do. Isaac said, okay. I believe at some point there they had a discussion. And I think that Isaac's faith was just as strong as Abraham's faith. God, I mean, Abraham probably explained to him, here's what we're doing. You're the son of promise. I'm going to sacrifice you. God will raise you. Because God's going to keep his promise. Maybe that's how it went. But Isaac had just as strong of a faith here as Abraham did, knowing what was about to happen to him. And you think about this, after it's all over and they go back down the mountain and going about their life, think of the story that, Abraham, that Isaac had to tell. Yeah, we went up to the mountain and my dad, Abraham, he was about to kill me there as a sacrifice, but it didn't happen. God stopped him. And that's a good story to tell. My, my father, he follows God. My father, he does what God tells him to do. You're not going to find a more faithful person. Isaac had a story to tell to his others about the faith of his father. Will our children have a story to tell about our faith? Will they have a story to tell about our faith? How strong we were when we were put to the test, how we came through it, or will there be no stories there to tell? I don't know. I don't know, my parents never did this or never did that. And, you know, we need to live a kind of a life of faith that, that leaves uh, our children a story about what strong faith is. They may not follow it, but yet they have it, the example put before them of what being a strong Christian is about. And then Genesis 15 and verse 6, Ephesians 2 and verse 8. There's two ways that one can, can be saved. The first way is if you have no sin. Uh, do everything right. But we know we're not going to do everything right. That's why I know the children, 
No children, they're saved. No problem, they have no sin. No, no problems there. But we do sin. And Abraham here says, and he believed the Lord and accounted to him for righteousness. And in Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, not that of yourself, it's the gift of God. <clears throat> Abraham believed God. He trusted in God. That faith saved him that he had there. He had a faith that, that operated, that worked, that was put into action. He did. It wasn't Abraham's, uh, it was Abraham's idea to offer up Isaac. If it had been, it wouldn't have worked. If Abraham had said to God, now God, to, I want to show you how much faith I have. I'm going to offer up my son for you. And that way, you'll just see how great I am. It wouldn't have worked. Isaac would have died. Abraham, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have been the father. Again, it wasn't Abraham's idea to do this. It was God telling him to do it. Abraham did with full trust. That's the same way that we operate as well. God says, by grace, he made salvation available. He said, if you want it, here it is. Here's what you go. Here's what you do in order to be saved. And we do that. Again, it's not our idea. We didn't come up with a plan, but God did. So there we have Abraham. That's two pretty big events in Abraham's life. And Isaac, we'll talk more about Isaac next week a little bit. But Isaac was a, a peaceful man. He, he liked to be living in peace among people. And in chapter 26 here, he, uh, Abraham dug some wells here and there. And Isaac goes into the land and he says, well, here's my dad's wells, but they're full of stuff. Somebody's going to fill them in. And the Philistines did. So Isaac, he digs, digs them out. All this junk out that the Philistines put in there and got new good fresh water. And, you know, what are they doing with the water, drinking it or giving it to the cattle or other animals? The Philistines hear about it and they come to Isaac say, what are you doing getting water out of our wells? And Isaac says, it's not your wells. My dad dug these wells. And they go back and forth, back and forth. And instead of causing the fuss, what does Isaac do? He goes and digs another well. Okay, you can have it. That's what 26 and verse 18 of Genesis says. And Isaac dug again the wells of water, which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father, for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. So he said, he chose, he chose peace. I want to be at peace with y'all instead of going in war. And what would we have done? Here's a well that been in the famine all these years, and all of a sudden somebody claims it. We done dug it up and dug it and cleaned it out. And they come up and claim, that's my well. Are we going to live at peace with that? Are we going to get mad and start fighting over it? Are we going to get mad and say, okay, it can be yours. And all of a sudden we fill it back up. Well, that's not what Isaac did. He wanted to be at peace with these people. He was, he was a peace-loving individual. Uh, he chose peace. And again, that's what we got to do. We'll be happier if we choose peace. We'll be happier in our in our own our own personal life. We'll be happy in our families. We'll be happier in, in our church family if we choose peace. We don't we don't want to be the the instigators on these things. We don't want that. That's a pretty pretty good deal there to tell us something about the Isaac. And then last in Genesis twenty five twenty eight, another problem Isaac had was that he. Uh, he showed favoritism. And Isaac loved Esau, but because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Favoritism is not going to work. Parents have favorites. It won't work. And we're going to talk about that next week, how this favoritism led to a lot of problems. A lot of problems for Isaac, a lot of problems for uh, Jacob, eventually on down the road. And a lot of problems.
So that's the overview, a little bit of Abraham's life and Isaac's life. And, and we'll look more next week at Isaac and, and, uh, and Jacob and, and Esau and, and others. Any comment or question on, the, on anything of these tonight? Okay. Well, I'll stop here. About time for the bell. <laughs>